Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! For a lot of voters, the central issue in this election campaign is the condition of our most loved institution, the National Health Service. But these have not been easy years for the NHS or those working in it, and the Health Secretary responsible for the NHS in England may have his work cut out, explaining why its future will be brighter under the Tories, and he joins me now. Good, we morning, tend to, good morning, We tend to bandy numbers a lot in these conversations. Let me start with a very simple question, which is, if I wake up in the middle of the night and I've got some pain inside me and I'm rushed to A&E, how soon should I be seen? Well, the standard says that you should be seen within four hours, not just seen, but also treated and either discharged home or admitted to hospital. Okay. When was the last time the NHS in England hit that target? Well, we haven't hit it for over two years. Um, it's not acceptable. Uh, we have a plan to get back to that standard. But um, it's so also important... if people vote Conservative, can they expect you back on that standard, hitting that standard after the election? And if so, why? Well, I think, with respect, you've got to look at what's actually happening in A&E departments, which is, despite the huge Longer pressure, rates. the huge pressure of an ageing population, uh, half a million more over 75s since 2010, we are actually seeing, within that crucial four-hour standard, more than 2,000 people every single day actually being seen within the standard. Now, demand has gone up by faster than that, which is why we're investing in more doctors, more nurses, we're putting in more funding than ever before. And yes, I'm absolutely saying that we have said uh, we intend to get back to that standard next year, and it's very, very important that we do so. Because uh, another good example of how the NHS is performing or not performing um, is the 18-week rule, which is that, again, if I'm in a GP's surgery, he says, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Marr, there's something serious happened to you. You have to go into hospital for an operation or some kind of uh, procedure. I will be seen within 18... I'll be there within 18 weeks. And again, how, can you remind us how many people are not seen within 18 weeks at the moment? Well, the standard is 92%, and currently we are on 90%. But if I may say... So in terms you are, of people not yeah, being seen, that's yeah, how many? That's a significant number. But let me just say, you've picked two examples. I don't think that is a fair reflection of the performance of the NHS. And this is important. But just before the election was called at the end of March, the NHS published an independent report in which they said that if you take most major conditions, heart attack, stroke, cancer, so on, outcomes have dramatically improved over the last five years. And the example they gave was cancer, where they said that 7,000 people are alive today who wouldn't have been alive if we'd kept with the cancer survival rates of 2012. And I think people watching this programme, there will okay. be thousands and thousands who will say they have had a good NHS experience. They recognise the pressures on the NHS, the pressures on some of those crucial standards, which we are absolutely committed to getting right. But they can also see that there are more doctors, more nurses, more funding than ever before. No, nobody is saying, and I'm certainly not saying that nothing is going well in the NHS, I'm not saying that at all, but those are both two rules that you set yourself, the four-week rule and the 18-week, the four-hour rule and the 18-week rule, to be judged by, and you have failed on both of them. But then... 370,000 people are now are not seen within 18 weeks, and that number is going up very fast, 100,000 in the last year alone. Well, they are very, very important standards, but they aren't the only standards. And let me tell you another standard. They're important standard. to the humane yeah. working of the NHS. Absolutely. But so is making sure that we don't have a repeat of what happened at mid-staffs. And if you look at what's mm. happened since 2010, every day in the NHS we're doing about 5,000 more operations. But the number of patients being harmed, the proportion being harmed with things like uh, blood clots, avoidable falls, pressure ulcers and so on, mm is down by 8%, despite a yes. huge increase in activity. So I think there's fantastic things happening in the NHS. I think it's very important that, so that I, people like I you say, I focus on the bigger picture. I do understand that there are good things as good. well as bad things, but here is the Royal College of Physicians saying, our NHS is underfunded, underdoctored and overstretched. Patients are waiting longer on lists, on trolleys, in emergency departments and in their homes for the care they need. An increasing number of people, although clinically ready to go home, cannot safely leave hospital as the care system is unable to cope. People's lives are being put at risk. That's the 
Royal College of Physicians. That's not the BBC or anybody else. It's a very, very serious assessment of where the NHS is under Jeremy Hunt. And what has Jeremy Hunt and what has this government been doing about that? Um, because I agree we need more doctors and since I've been health secretary we've actually got six and a half thousand more doctors. We've got 15,000 more nurses and on the funding issue I think this is the really this is what crucial... I want to come to, yeah, okay well let's let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, so we did have a, a very difficult period straight after uh, 2010 after the financial collapse we had mm -hmm. uh, the austerity period um, but then towards the end of that period as soon as we were able to as conservatives because we are absolutely committed to the NHS we want to be the party of the NHS uh, since uh, over the last three years we're putting in an extra six and a half billion pounds a year and the result of that is you're seeing an NHS well, which has got more funding, more doctors, more nurses. But I put it to you, not enough. I mean, you've got a real problem of pay in the NHS. Nurses who have had seven years of pay freeze. Uh, I put it to the Prime Minister, that the Royal College of Nursing says that nurses are having to go to food banks at the moment. And she said there were complex reasons why people go to food banks. Are there complex reasons why nurses have to go to food banks? Well, let's look at the facts. Uh, the minimum a nurse can be paid in this country is £22,000, £27,000 in inner London. Uh, that assumes they do no night shifts or antisocial hours, which in practice most of them will. Uh, the average pay for nurses is £31,000, which is and more down than by 11 the national average. in real terms. Well, we don't agree with those numbers, but that's still they're getting paid more than the national average. But is that enough? Considering so the brilliant work, that, no, you've got to let me answer the question. Is that enough? Considering the brilliant work that they do, I think many people would say we want to pay them more. I think they do an incredible job. So if you want more money, and yeah. you've asked me this before, if you want more money to go into the NHS, and this government recognises we will need to put more money into the NHS and social care system because of the pressures we face, then the question is how you get there. And there is a exactly. non-NHS issue that overshadows everything which is the Brexit negotiations, and I, I'm sorry to come to this, but it's very, no, very important don't. because... I'm you're coming to it. Because um. if we don't get a good Brexit outcome and we don't protect the economic recovery, the jobs that uh, so many people depend on whose taxes pay for the NHS, if we get a bad Brexit outcome, that will be a disaster for the NHS. And the choice that people face is do they want a strong... Theresa May doing those very difficult negotiations. We've got 27 countries lined up against us. Some of them appear to think that for the EU to survive, Britain must fail. And we need a strong Prime Minister, or do we want Jeremy okay, Corbyn, who can't even get his own party to agree on Brexit? Let me interrogate Brexit? that a little bit. In terms of the good deal that you say this country must have for the NHS to thrive, presumably that does not include no deal. Would, well, it, would, would no deal damage the NHS badly? Well, uh, we've been very clear that uh, no deal is better than a bad deal. Um, and, and I'm asking you whether no deal, leaving without an agreement, would damage the NHS, in your view? Well, we want a deal. We think That's not a my deal. Question. Well, no, no, we've, let me answer mm. very directly. We think a deal, getting a, a good deal, would be better for the NHS, better for the economy, better for jobs, better for all of us. But uh, we also recognise that a bad deal would be bad for the country, bad for our long-term future, and we're not prepared to say that we will get a deal at any cost. And the, and the real question, though, is... But with respect, I'm sorry, with respect, what you're really saying is good is good and bad is bad. And what I'm asking you is, if we don't get a deal, is that bad for the NHS? Well, um, you're showing a lot of respect to me this morning, and, uh, and thank you for that. But I would just say this, that what I'm saying very clearly is an answer to your question, Andrew, which is I'm saying that a good deal would be best good. for the NHS, um, but obviously... Um, a bad deal would be the worst possible outcome for all our public services because it would be bad for the country. Now, the question because is, you who do you... this whole no, no, thing no, no. very straightforwardly. I've got an idea for you, which I saw. I picked up from the side of a bus. We're paying, according to the official figure, something like uh, 18 billion over the next few years, 12 billion per year over the next few years, to the uh, EU. We could take that money and we could spend it on the NHS. And you could go to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, you could say, that's what we need for the NHS. I'm on the front line, I know, that's what we should be spending and that's what we should be promising the British people during this election campaign. Well, what we're promising the British people is uh, the credible promise that 
if we want, as this government has shown, an extra, you know, six and a half billion in the last three years alone in the NHS, if we're going to continue putting more money in, then we need that good deal, that strong economy. We're not going to uh, promise stuff that we can't deliver. My, my worry about some of the promises you hear from Labour is that if you start making promises on the NHS and then you find you can't deliver them on things like nurses' pay, uh, what actually ends up happening is you end up having to lay off nurses from our wards and then we go straight back to all the problems that we had in mid-staffs. But I, just, I think there's a very important one. You know about stroke care better than mm -hmm. many, many people. And, and I think stroke is a very good example of the good things that are happening as well as the challenges in the NHS. Because, because we, according to the OECD, have seen some of the biggest improvements in stroke care in this country, uh, saving thousands more lives. That's a fantastic okay. thing. But, but what we now have is new technology that can save even more lives. Now, what I want is funding for the NHS to be able to do that new technology. And I know that with a strong Theresa May battling for Britain against those other countries, we have the best chance of getting that deal. And the, the well, it's, look, it's looking pretty cantankerous at the moment. I mean, it's been a very, very cantankerous week on both sides. And a lot of people looking at this think, do you know what I, what I don't want is a punch-up. I want a proper grown-up negotiation with mutual respect and so forth. I don't want a punch-up and I don't want to hear Juncker saying one thing and Theresa May coming back at him and thump, thump, thump. Well, we all want that. But what I would say is that... Uh, there is something very different about this election because in a normal election okay. you are choosing a Prime Minister for the next five years but this time we're choosing a Prime Minister who will do the Brexit negotiations that will last okay. for generations before, and that's why before we Theresa come May's back to role that, is going to be just so before important. We, I'm sorry, sorry. Before we come back to that, you're announcing big changes on mental health this week. Um, you're tearing up the Mental Health Act and I wonder why and you're going to appoint, I'm told, 10,000 new mental health experts. But you've sacked 6,000 of these people over the last few years. So what's going on? OK, um, well, first of all, uh, this is a very important uh, decision that we're going to deal with two real injustices. If you have a child that has uh, severe mental health problems and you find that that child, instead of getting treated by the NHS, actually ends up in a police cell, that is a terrible thing for the child, probably make their condition worse, um, but it's also very bad for the police as well. We want to stop that. And we also want to stop the, the fact that one in six of us um, have a mental health disorder, depression, anxiety. Can the government stop that? No, no, not, we, we want to stop the fact that you can lose your job for that and suffer discrimination uh, in a way that you would not be able to suffer now if you were disabled or um, other conditions, and, and we want to address those. So, uh, Theresa May has a very important economic mission, which is to get the best Brexit deal, protect Britain's jobs and our economy. But she also said on the steps of Downing Street that she has a big social mission. She says right. she wants a country that is works for everyone. Is there any new money everyone. for this? Uh, there is a lot of new money going into it. We, in January, we said we're going to put an extra billion pounds into mental health services and by... And this come from other parts of the NHS or is it new money to the NHS? No, it is, come, it is new money going into the NHS right. that's going into mental health. Um, and, you know, it's not just, of course, money, it's having the people who deliver these okay. jobs, which is why we need the 10,000 extra professionals. We, you've talked about Brexit several times. Can I ask uh, whether the Cabinet understands why and how the European Commission is trying to interfere and rig our election campaign? Well, I think it's very plain for everyone to see and I think that because Brexit is the significant issue that overshadows everything in this election uh, that it's a decision that's made by the British people and what people can see is that Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP yes. have all said they disagree I, with Theresa May's approach so, so are you every saying, vote so are for you Theresa May, what we're saying is every vote for Theresa May will strengthen her hand in those negotiations because they will say to the Europeans who are causing us some of these problems that the country is four square behind Theresa in getting the best deal for Britain. And she said that they were deliberately interfering in this country's election to produce a... It's presumably what you think is that they're interfering to help Jeremy Corbyn uh, against the Prime Minister. Is that the allegation? Well, I think, you know, yeah, they, didn't have to to, they didn't have to leak these reports to newspapers of uh, dinners that happened in the middle of an election campaign. Sure. And, so and why did they do it? Well, it is the wrong approach to negotiations. Uh, we want good negotiations. We want a good outcome. I'm sorry, and the Prime Minister said this was about trying to fix our election. And I'm just asking you, how are they trying to fix our election and in whose favour? Well, you know, you'll have to ask them why they chose to do that. But I think the answer is very clear that they are trying to uh, leak reports that 
undermine Theresa May's position. And I think what the so British people know... the Conservatives in this election? I think what the British people I'm know sorry, is it is for them to decide on this, not for people from other countries. Are they trying to damage the Conservatives in this election, in your well, view? Well, that must be the presumption. And ah, what we're okay, saying is... Right that they should not be doing that because this is an election for the British people to decide. So the Commission is intervening in this election to try to jam damage the Conservative cause and therefore to benefit the opposition parties? Well, we're saying we don't want that to happen. It shouldn't happen. And this must be a decision for the British people. Jeremy Hunt, thanks very much for talking to Thank us. You. I'm delighted to be joined by the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. Um, Jeremy, you've just announced a whole new approach to mental health. One of the commitments you're making is that fewer people with mental health issues will end up in police cells. So where are they going to go? Well, what we need is to look after them in the NHS. Good morning, Robert, by the way. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me onto the programme. I mean, at the but moment... where are they going to go in the NHS? Because, you know, the NHS doesn't have the beds, it doesn't have the... Where? Well, that is what, why we are undergoing probably the biggest expansion of mental health anywhere in Europe at the moment. Uh, well, you're undergoing up... it, but I talk to mental health doctors and they say the money is not getting through to them. Well, if you look at the, the actual facts in terms of the money, um, an independent NHS report a couple of months ago said that there's 1.4 billion more being spent on mental health compared to three years ago, about 120,000 more people. It's been allocated, but is it getting through? As I no, say, no, I talk to mental health doctors and they say their resources are not increasing. So this is actually what's being spent, um, and we're actually treating around 120,000 more people a year. But what this is really about today is if you are... Uh, a parent who has a child with uh, some really serious psychological illnesses. Uh, what you want is for that child to be treated by the NHS. But too often what happens is that the first line of help you get is from the police service and you can end up being in a police cell and that can make the condition worse. Um, it's it's, obviously, I mean, it's, appalling, it's, isn't it's it? obviously bad for the police. Um, and so what we need to do is to improve what we call in the NHS our crisis care response to make sure... So how quickly will you be able to provide alternative facilities so that the police do not lock up vulnerable people? Well, we are making good progress. Um, but how long? Well, um, we said that between now and 2020, in order to deliver this commitment, uh, that we will recruit an extra 10,000 professionals into mental health services because it's not just about money, it's actually having the people mm -hmm. who can deliver the services you need. But this will mean that we have to do crisis care better. And this is part of what's called parity of esteem. So that we changed the law in 2012 and we said that mental and physical health should be treated equally, uh, what's called parity of esteem. But at the moment, if you have a mental health crisis, you don't get as good care but as this, people this who have a, of a stroke or a heart attack. This is terribly heart. important, and if you talk to mental health campaigners, they were shocked when, with your reforms, your proposed reforms to the personal injury payments, that that, they said, discriminated against people with mental health issues. Well, we listened very, very carefully to what they said, um, because we absolutely want to make sure that doesn't happen. But there's another... Well, they fear it yeah, is happening. Yeah, but there's another... I mean, if we talk about discrimination against people with mental health conditions, that's something else that um, Theresa May has announced today, which is another type of discrimination, which is one in six of us has at any one time a, a mental health condition depression, anxiety, and it, it hits anyone. I mean, it doesn't matter, you can be successful, have a happy family life. These things really just come out of the blue. And uh, what is awful is some people find they lose their job mm -hmm. because of it. And the reason for that is that you're only currently in the law protected against discrimination if it's been a continuous mental health condition for 12 months on the, on the trot. And obviously, for a lot of these conditions, they come and they go. So. Theresa May is saying today she wants to change that. So how will you change it? Will you set up, a, you know, the equivalent of the kind of commissions we have for gender inequality and race inequality? Will there be a, a body to which people can complain if they feel they're discriminated against? Well, I don't think this is about more commissions. This is about the law protecting people against discrimination for a mental health condition in the same way it protects you against discrimination if you're disabled. And, and why is it that this is important? Because... Theresa May, when she was on the steps of Downing Street, again, when she became... Let me just finish this. Sure. She, she said that she had an economic mission, yes, to deliver the best deal for Britain on Brexit and protect people's jobs, but also a social mission. She used the phrase, a country that works for everyone. Um, and clearly, at the moment, if you have uh, 
uh, mental health problems, we are not doing as well as we would like to. Although it has to be said, many people would say we have some of the best mental health provision in Europe, but it's still not good enough. Well, uh, many people would say we have hugely inadequate mental mm. health no, no, provision. No, no. Now, but on that point about discrimination, you know, everybody, I think, listening or watching today would agree that ending discrimination is a good thing, but we have no detail. Well, I think um, it's... It's pretty detailed today, if I may say. Um, well, we've said we are going you, to you, you, replace you... the 1983 Mental Health Act. We've said that we are going to um, change the law so that uh, people do not suffer discrimination for mental health conditions in the way they but, currently do. But hang do. on a second. If, if you are suffering from a mental health problem, you are probably the last person who is going to be capable of going to law to protect yourself. So many will say in the absence of a body that effectively comes in and helps you, nothing is going to change. Well, um, this isn't just about uh, asking people with mental health problems to take their cases to the law. This is actually asking employers to change yeah. their behaviour. Now, employers yeah. don't want to be on the wrong side of the law. They do respond to yeah. changes in law on discrimination. It's about the personnel departments of companies understanding that when it comes to mental health, uh, this is not uh, something that's abnormal this is something that's very very common and yep. we all all of us in our life have crises at different moments uh, and uh, another part of the changes that uh, we're announcing today is to have mental health first aid in every school sure. in the country to help prepare people we have got a crises. lot of time so i must now move on to the wider nhs um, on your watch per capita spending will rise well Actually, it will fall over the 10 years since 2010 to two, from 2010 to 2020. Resources going into the NHS are a fraction under this government of what they've been in, on average, since the health service was created, which is why every doctor says to me there is a crisis. Well, uh, something you said is right and something you said is profoundly wrong. What's wrong? Uh, and so what is wrong, first of all, is when it comes to funding, uh, we had a very difficult period after 2010, the, the austerity period uh, when uh, we were dealing with the financial crisis of 2008, getting the economy back on its feet. But uh, since then, in the well, last I looked three at the period, years... 2010 yeah, to 2020 yeah. is the period I was looking at, I know, but just over that period, per capita spending is down. Well, let me just finish, because, as I say, you've looked at... If you look at the period since 2010, there are really two halves. There's the first period where... NHS spending wasn't cut, but it didn't go up by very much. But then since then, we've actually spending now six and a half billion pounds a year more on the NHS than we were spending. Which your own bosses is barely enough, Simon Stevens. Well, that's not quite right, actually. This is actually the amount of money that uh, he negotiated and said he needed for his plan. But what he specifically... He very publicly said that he did not think it was a generous settlement. Well, let me tell you where... I think it has been very tough for the NHS uh, since 2010 uh, because uh, they've had typically 4% increases in funding uh, since the founding of the NHS. We haven't been able to do that. Yep. However, the funding has been much more generous in terms of the increases in recent years and we would like to continue that. But the question is, if we're going to do will, that... Will there be more resources if Theresa May wins? Will you increase... Will the rate of spending in the NHS go up? Well, if Theresa May wins... Her priority will be to get the best Brexit deal for Britain that protects the economy, protects all the jobs that we've created in the last seven years, nearly three million jobs, that pay the taxes for the NHS, so that we can then fund the NHS. And, you know, well, people we... will notice you aren't making the kind of commitment that Labour is making to increase funding. But I've also just got to put... We asked our viewers to ask the questions that were on their minds. Um, so, Sean says... Um, is my wife having an affair? She works in the NHS and goes in all hours, including weekends, but we know it's not supposed to be 24-7. In other words, people in the NHS feel that you are asking them to work too much, too long. Well, people in the NHS are working incredibly hard, um, and what I'm doing to try and uh, relieve that pressure is to get more doctors and nurses into the NHS. And since I've been Health Secretary, for example, we have 15,000 more nurses um, on the back of significant extra funding that's going in. But I don't make any apology for saying that I also want our care in the NHS to be the very best in the world. And where we have problems, like, for example, we know that uh, mortality rates for people admitted at weekends 
are higher than people admitted at the week and we want to do something about that and that does mean that there are parts of the NHS where we need to improve the we had, we, had, we, had, we, we, we had that debate you know about a year ago and I must just therefore put you so on the hashtag ask hunt Jonathan Ashworth your opposite sent in a question 1.8 million people waited longer than four hours in A&E up from about 350,000 in 2009-10 that's a dramatic increase that is a failure isn't it well, I'm delighted that Jonathan's watching the programme this morning. And what I would say to him, which he didn't choose to mention in that question, is that uh, compared to when Labour are in office, if you take that four-hour standard, 2,000 more people are being seen within four hours. But every when will the target day. be met? When will that and, target be met? And, and let me just ask a question. Come on, about, come on, you know, come on, come on, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. When will the target be met on the uh, four-hour waiting time? Well, it's a very important target. And uh, will it we, be met in the next Parliament if you win? Uh, yes. And we have said that we will, much sooner than that, we said we want to get back to meeting that target next year. But if Jonathan Ashworth is watching this programme, you might want to ask him back um, how we could have delivered those extra 2,000 people being seen within four hours every day if we cut the NHS budget as Labour chose to do in Wales. Jeremy, lovely to see you. We hope you'll come back before the election. So the Conservatives are promising, if re-elected, to change mental health laws in England and Wales to tackle discrimination. They're promising 10,000 more staff working in NHS mental health treatment in England by 2020. Though how that's to be funded isn't quite clear. Here's Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt speaking on The Andrew Marr Show earlier. There is a lot of new money going into it. We, in January, we said we're going to put an extra billion pounds into mental health services and by... And this come from other parts of the NHS or is it new money to the NHS? No, it is, come, it is new money going into the NHS right. that's going into mental health. Um, and, you know, it's not just, of course, money, it's having the people who deliver these okay. jobs, which is why we need the 10,000 extra professionals. We well, that was Jeremy Hunt, the Health Secretary. We're joined now from Norwich by the Liberal Democrat Health Spokesman Norman Lamb. This weekend, they made their own health announcement, promising a one percentage point rise on every income tax band to fund the NHS. Uh, Norman Lamb, do you welcome the Conservatives putting mental health onto the campaign agenda in the way that they have? I welcome it being on the campaign agenda, but I fear that the announcement uh, is built on thin air. Uh, you raised the issue at the start about the 10,000 extra staff and questions about how it would be paid for. There is no additional money beyond what they've already announced uh, for the NHS. And we all know that it falls massively short on the uh, expectation of the funding gap, which by 2020 is likely to be about 30 billion. That's really not disputed now. And anyone outside the government, wherever you are on the political spectrum, knows that the money going in is simply not enough. Uh, and so, you know, just rather like the, uh, the, 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 the sort of claim that they would add 5,000 GPs to the workforce by 2020, that isn't on target. In fact, the latest figures show a fall in the number of GPs. So, you know, they make these claims, but I'm afraid they're uh, without substance oh. unless they're prepared to put the money behind it. And your party's um, solution to the money problem is to put a, a, a 1% percentage point on all the bands of income tax at 20, 40 and 45 to raise more money. Is that fair, though, in that most pensioners uh, who consume 40% of NHS spending, uh, but over 65s, they only pay about 20% of income tax. So, uh, are you not penalising a younger generation for the health care of an older generation? Well, Andrew, it's the first step in, in what we're describing as a five point recovery plan for both the NHS and the care system. So, uh, for what's available to us now, it seems to us to be the fairest way to bring in extra resources. Income tax is a progressive tax. Uh, it's based on your ability to pay. For your average British worker, it would be £3 a week. That's the cost of less than two cups of, uh, of coffee a week. Uh, but in the longer run, and we're saying that by the end of the next Parliament, we would aim to introduce a dedicated NHS and care tax uh, based probably around a reformed national insurance system so that it becomes a dedicated NHS and care tax. Uh, and interestingly, the uh, former permanent secretary at the Treasury, Nick McPherson, has uh, said clearly that uh, this 
uh, idea merits further consideration. That's the oh, first time right. anyone from the Treasury has sort of bought into the well, idea of a hypothecated he, tax to that uh, way. Treasury. But sure. let me ask you this. You say it's a small amount of tax that people on average incomes will have to pay extra. But we're talking about people who've really seen no real increase in their incomes since 2007. Uh, they, they've been struggling just to stand still in terms of uh, their real uh, pay. And yet you are going to add to their tax. And as I said earlier, most of the, the health care money will then go to pensioners uh, whose incomes have risen 15%. I'm just interested in the, 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 the fairness of this redistribution. So bear in mind, first of all, Andrew, that the, <coughs> the uh, raising of the tax threshold that the Lib Dems pushed through in the, in the coalition uh, increased uh, the effective pay in your pocket for uh, basic rate taxpayers by up about a thousand pounds. We're talking about a tiny uh, fraction of that. Uh, and I suppose you have to ask, we all uh, in this country have to ask ourselves the question, uh, are we prepared to pay, in terms of the average worker, that three pounds extra a week uh, in order to sort of give us that guarantee that uh, when our loved ones need that care uh, in their hour of need, perhaps a suspected cancer, that care will be available for them. I've had two cases recently brought to my attention. An elderly couple, uh, the, the wife uh, has a very bad hip. They just couldn't allow that wait to continue. She was told she'd have to wait 26 weeks. She was in acute pain. They've ended up paying £20,000 for private treatment to circumvent the waiting time. Oh. Now, and they hated doing it because they I didn't understand. want to jump the queue, but that's what's increasingly happening. Uh, we're seeing right, a, a I'm really... I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr Lamb. Uh, you make very good points, but we're very short of time sure. today. So I just wanted one final question to you. Uh, it does look as if you won't get the chance to do any of this, because I, I'm told now the best you can hope to do internally, you think, is to double the number of seats, which would only take you to 18 seats. Uh, and do you think that promising to raise people's income tax, even those on average earnings, is a vote winner? Look, I, I think actually people in this country are crying out for politicians to be straight and to tell it as it is. And we're at the moment heading towards a conservative landslide. But I ask the, people, that, of this, but I ask the people of this country, do we actually want a one-party state? And we're electing a government now not just to deal with the Brexit negotiation, crucial though that is. We're electing a government to oversee the stewardship of our NHS, the funding of our schools, all these other critical issues. We need an effective opposition. Right. And with the Labour Party having taken itself off stage, the Lib Dems must provide that effective opposition. All right. Norman, thank you for joining us this thank morning. Thank you.